into uh, the Antichrist and the, the things that the Antichrist will do in the end times. And so uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is a type of the Antichrist, and we've talked about that quite a bit. And tonight we're going to see him as the willful king. This is kind of a, a nickname that the Antichrist is given, the willful king. And so um, as we begin tonight, you know, there are a lot of things that went on within uh, the nation of Israel as Antiochus Epiphanes came and, and really persecuted the, the Israelites there and uh, trashed the temple out and the abomination of desolation uh, type and shadow there as he poured out pig's blood on the altar and those kind of things and set up an image. And we've talked about that stuff quite a bit. He did all that stuff, but and then it's going to go into talking about how the, the people there who knew their God uh, rose up and did great exploits. And so... You know, this idea of the willful king just kind of doing whatever he wants to do and, and uh, willful disobedience to the Lord, willful evilness as he's carrying out his plans. Um, you know, as, as we look at the leaders that we have today and, and the pictures of the Antichrist that we see in the future uh, and just the kingdom of the Antichrist and what will go on in the end, it really, um, it really is, is hard to deal with when we think about those things uh, just being under that kind of evil persecution and and um, those kind of things, it, it's kind of a frightening picture. But uh, one thing that I wanted to bring across tonight and, and just kind of talk about it all the way through the rest of the chapter here is the idea of the Lord being on our side. If we are loyal to Him, He is He's there for us and will defend us. Second Chronicles 16.9, it says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Within this passage tonight, we're going to find that uh, the type of the Antichrist, the guy uh, Antiochus there, he will align himself with those who are against God or against his covenant with his covenant people. And, uh, and those are the people he will hang with. And so the Lord is looking to and fro for those who are loyal to him. And so uh, he will show himself strong on our behalf is a promise that he has made to us. And so I want to begin with that in the light of, you know, the heaviness of, of some of the biblical prophecy that we are going to see here in this chapter, the rest of this chapter and on into chapter 12. The Lord is on our side if we are loyal to him. And so we'll begin with that. Uh, looking at uh, verse 28 is where we left off talking about these two kings going back and forth, the king of the north and the king of the south, battling back and forth with one another and getting the upper hand over one another and then and they come back and conquer each other. And uh, the king of the north is, of course, Antiochus Epiphanes and his family, his lineage coming before him, his, his um, ancestors. And so uh, he's battling with the, the kingdom of... Uh, the the Egyptian portion there, the Ptolemy uh, um, kingdom that came out of the Grecian Empire. When the Grecian Empire fell, it broke off into four sections, and uh, and the two sections we're talking about now are the Ptolemy and uh, and Seleucid empires. And so anyway, as we begin, uh, I'm not going to go in depth into the history portion of it like we did last time, but just to give you a little background there. Uh, those are the two kings we're talking about in verse 27. Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table. But it shall not prosper, for the end will be at the appointed time. And so again, God is in control of the events of history and the events of the future. And so in verse 28, he says there, again, this is the angel, um, possibly Gabriel, relaying to Daniel the things that are going to happen in the future. Uh, while returning to his land, speaking about Antiochus Epiphanes, with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his own land. And at the appointed time, he shall return and go toward the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter, for ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return in rage against the Holy Covenant and do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. 
then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. And so that's, again, where we get that term from, uh, spoken about in a couple of different areas within Daniel. Um, but uh, we're going to look at it a little bit here more tonight. First thing we want to look at, the uh, true colors of the Antichrist here. You know, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he will be a world figure. And uh, he will appear to want to have uh, a good relation with all the world governments of the world and, and, and just be a peaceful king seeking to have, you know, just a, a cessation of, of war and violence and hunger and pestilence and all that. You know, he'll come out with a, a grand plan to solve all the problems of the world. Uh, but very soon his focus will turn on the nation of Israel because that is God's chosen people. And he will want to go there and set up his image in the sanctuary there. And so we see a type of this here within uh, the uh, Seleucid Empire. His true colors are coming out as he's wanting to move against the nation and move against those uh, people of the covenant, the, against the holy covenant. Speaking about that covenant that God has with his people in the land there of Israel. And so um, you can see that very clearly there. What is interesting about this passage, these couple of verses we just read, uh, these ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Remember we talked about the fourth kingdom uh, being the Roman Empire. And so now we are beginning to see within the passage here an emergence of the Roman uh, power throughout the world as, uh, as the Seleucid Empire is coming down trying to attack Egypt once again and trying to take dominance down there, we find that Rome has already moved into this area and has kind of staked their claim. And uh, they're not going to allow this to continue, these wars that are going back and forth. They're going to become that stabilizing force in the entire Mediterranean basin there. And so uh, now we're seeing that emergence as the, uh, the Roman navy is coming down there from, from Cyprus. Um, some translations of the Bible even say that it's the Romans who stood up to him here at this point. Um, it's very interesting. There's a story that talks about this engagement as Antiochus Epiphanes comes down to Alexandria, Egypt, and is wanting to go in there and establish himself again. Uh, the Romans are already there. And, and the Roman leader here, this guy, you can pronounce the name if you'd like. Uh, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> But he's already there and he tells Antiochus Epiphanes in no uncertain terms, get out of here and get out of here now and don't ever come back. And, and basically he says to him, uh, there's, a, there's a story that he drew, drew a circle around Antiochus Epiphanes and said, I want your answer before you step out of this circle. And it kind of gives you an indication of the kind of guy we're talking about as Antiochus Epiphanes is a, a flatterer. You know, he's a sweet talker, you know. And, and so the Roman council here, he, he draws a circle around him. He says, I want you out of here and I want your answer before you step out of that circle. And, uh, and basically he's letting him know, you know, we're going to clobber you if you don't get out of here and not come back. And so it's an interesting story from, from history uh, that we see there. All right, well, uh, another common denominator here among the nations, as you see there in the end of verse 30, uh, he shall return. He, he's very angry at this, as, as the Roman governor tells him to get out. He's grieved, and he returns in rage against the Holy Covenant to do damage there. And he says, it says there, he, so he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Hey, if you're against Israel, you're on my side. If you're against this nation, you know, we've got a common interest. And so, so many times throughout the, the, the years, throughout the centuries, uh, 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years now, uh, nations who have nothing in common with one another can come to an agreement and say, let's go against the, the Jews, and, and they have. Uh, in modern times, you know, the, the Germans and the Arabs had a common bond with one another. And it was solely based on the fact that they both hated the Jews and wanted to see the Jews wiped out completely. And so uh, we see that throughout history, and, and it's just another picture of it right here within the Scriptures. And so he musters these forces together uh, so that they come and defile the sanctuary fortress uh, and take away the daily sacrifices. They basically ceased 
the uh, offering, uh, the daily offerings that were given to the Lord there at the temple in Jerusalem and did not allow that to continue on. Um, he offers an abomination of desolation. And again, we, we've mentioned this, and, and, but I just want to hit on it a couple more times in a different way here. This abomination, you think of what an abomination is. Uh, strictly, in, in the strict sense in the Bible, you know, an abomination is just a worship of false gods in any way, shape, or form. And so you think about an abomination that causes desolation. Uh, what is the most holy place on the entire earth? And you might say, well, Israel is. That's God's land. That's God's chosen uh, land for His people that He has designated. And that's true, but out of Israel, what's the most holy city? Of course, Jerusalem is the most holy city. What's the most holy place within Jerusalem? The temple, the temple mount. What's the most holy place within the temple? The holy of holies. And so, uh, you know, that's why you, you see Satan throughout the ages has come against this place and has wanted to go in there and set up his own image uh, through a man. Uh, he's wanted to go in there and desecrate that most holy place. And, and so we have seen this throughout history. Uh, Caligula was another one that wanted to go in there and desecrate the Holy of Holies. And so we just see another uh, type of that here. Uh, we saw it ha- happening at uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Certainly it would have happened as the Romans wanted to come in and take over that city and take over that temple. They certainly would have desecrated it, but the temple was destroyed by those who hated the Jews and so it couldn't happen. And so throughout history, uh, these kind of things have happened. And so I don't think it's even worthy of, of you know, contemplating, well, you know, the abomination of desolation happened then. That has already taken place. Certainly types of it have happened and, uh, and different uh, aspects have, have taken place, but uh, ultimate fulfillment is, is still yet future. And so Jesus even talked about, you know, it's still a yet future thing that's going to happen. Uh, what has happened here with Antiochus Epiphanes as he came in and offered, uh, you know, he set up the image of Zeus and did some other things in there, that was only a partial fulfillment of what will ultimately take place when the Antichrist system of government is on the earth. And so, um, again, the holiest place, so we talked about that. It's interesting here in verse 32, it says, those who do wickedly against the covenant shall corrupt, he shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. The people who know their God in the face of this very wicked, vile man, as uh, we went back and looked at, I think it was verse 22 or so, uh, 21, the Bible calls him a vile person. This very vile and wicked man with lots and lots of power, lots of wealth, a big army. He can go around and do whatever he wants to do. He comes in and he absolutely desecrates the temple there in Jerusalem. But it says the people who know their God the people who are grounded in their faith, the people who have uh, that, that background of knowing who their God is and knowing that their God is wanting to show Himself strong on their behalf if they're loyal to Him, they stood up to that even though they were greatly outnumbered and there was no hope for them to win against Antiochus Epiphanes. They stood up to Him at a cost of great loss to themselves and their lives and their families. They stood up to Him and, and did do great... Uh, exploits. And so, of course, we're talking about the Maccabean revolt, and, and this is a prophecy about that actually happening. And uh, what happened in 168 BC there, as Antiochus was angry at what the Romans had done, he mustered this large army. He goes into Jerusalem and desecrates that temple. He erected an idol to Zeus on the altar, desecrated its holiness with the blood of swine. He outlawed the studying of the Torah, basically their Bible, the law. Uh, observing the Sabbath and circumcision. All those things were now punishable under death as he made a decree. Uh, You're going to worship the gods of the the Greeks. You're not going to worship this God anymore. You're not going to offer idols to him any longer. And, And so a total desecration of that. He also forced the Jews to engage in idol worship. And shortly after desecrating that temple, he sent his army out into the different regions of Judea 
and began to force the, the local leaders to start worshiping these idols. And so this is what caused this, this uh, rebellion to break out. Of course, uh, only a couple years earlier, uh, I think maybe a, um, not even, I didn't even look at the dates on it, but it's many, many years earlier that uh, the Babylonian captivity that, that, you know, the whole book of Daniel is based in uh, happened. And so they were sent into that captivity because of idol worship. And so at this point, they are very, very against idol worship. And they are not going to fall for that again. And they're very, you know, they know their God. And they know what happened when they worshiped their idols before. And so they are, are, are very much um, wanting to not do that again. Uh, and so what happens during that rebellion? Uh, it's the reason the Jews celebrate Hanukkah to today, uh, to this very day. Uh, what happened during that time as they sent, as the Syrian army sent out their, uh, their envoys to try to enforce these new laws of Antiochus Epiphanes? Um, they went into these towns and they began to tell the local Jewish leaders there uh, to sacrifice a pig on this pagan altar. And one town that they went into, they didn't quite... Uh, Uh, expect the kind of resistance they got. When the Syrian uh, soldiers reached the town of Modin, about 12 miles northwest of the capital, they demanded that the local leader, Matthias, uh, or however you pronounce his name there, the Kohen, a member of the priestly class, be an example to his people by sacrificing a pig on a portable pagan altar. And, and that guy, Matthias, basically said, no way, we're not going to do it. He refused to do it. And he killed not only the Jew who stepped forward to do the Syrians' bidding, but also the king's representative with the rallying cry, whoever is for God, follow me. And that was the beginning of that revolt. We're not going to do this again. We're not going to go down this road of worshiping idols again. We're going to revolt if it costs us our lives. And they did. They went out and they, they did many, many great exploits as they became a guerrilla force against a vastly outnumbering army. They conducted guerrilla warfare, what we would consider guerrilla warfare today with a ragtag group of, of Minutemen type armies, you know, throwing stones and spears and stuff at this huge Syrian army. And at a cost of hundreds and even thousands of lives to the Jews within three years, three years to the day, they took that temple back over again. And they broke down that that altar that had been desecrated and they built a new altar and began offering sacrifices three years to the day of the time that that it was desecrated. And so uh, that is what Hanukkah is all about was the relighting of that menorah, the relighting and the the reestablishment of the worship of God there in the temple after that desecration had taken place. And so it's very interesting that it was three years, uh, don't you think? (laughs) In light of what we know about the seven-year tribulation period, the Antichrist will come in and set up that image halfway through, you know, three and a half years into the, the tribulation period. He will desecrate. He will uh, offer that abomination of desolation. And then at the end of the uh, next three and a half years is when the Lord will return. And so it's very close in in time frame there. Uh, Very interesting indeed. And so the great exploits of the Jewish people there prophesied ahead of time. Uh, Another thing that we can look at here as you continue on in verse 33, it says, And those of the people who understand shall instruct many... Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join them by intrigue. And some of those, understand, some of, those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. And so... Uh, a little bit of a riddle there as the way that's worded, but 
uh, I think we can see within that the, the martyrdom of the saints, you know, for standing up for the, the word of God, standing up for the testimony of God. And we see this. I want to take a look at uh, Revelation 6, if you can hold your place there. But just this idea that they are uh, refined, they're purified, they're made white until the time of the end goes right along with what is being talked about in Revelation 6.10. So we need to just take a look at that real quick. Give us some perspective here. Revelation 6.10, you see there, um, we could actually start in verse 8 or so. So I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him that sat on him, sat on it was death and Hades followed with him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death and with the beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, how holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren would be killed as they were, uh, was completed. And I looked and it goes on and on and talks about it. But you see there uh, just the saints who have, who have offered their lives. They, they, were, uh, they knew their Lord. They had that background. They had that desire to serve Him. They had that desire not to fall, not to give in but just to uh, do great exploits for the Lord, not willing to uh, compromise their testimony for the Lord and ended up giving the ultimate price for it. They're purified though. They are are seen with white robes and they are waiting for the time of the end. And so uh, flipping back over to Daniel, that's kind of uh, the end of the historical portion there. Um, and, and then from here on out, it really just starts giving you that picture of the Antichrist and, and uh, the things that are listed from here on out. It just seems there's a breaking point where uh, Antiochus Epiphanes no longer fits the pattern of what's being spoken about here. And, and it seems like it's talking about a totally different person. And so we see this uh, verse 36 and onward as just being a, a type of the Antichrist in the end times. And uh, the God of fortresses is what I've entitled this section. But in verse 36 there, it says, Then the king shall do according to his own will. And that's where we get that idea of the, the willful king. According to his own will. He's going to do whatever he wants to do as he has attained this power. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses, and a God which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things, Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god, which he, shall, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. All right, so this god of fortresses, um, it, back in verse 36 again there, uh, we want to look at this again as, as future fulfillments that are going to happen in the time of the end not necessarily in the time that we are living in, in the church age. Although, again, we've talked about, you know, we can start seeing signs of these things developing. And I I really do see that in the world that we live in today. We're not going to see the Antichrist. I don't believe that as believers in Jesus, we will see the Antichrist. Uh, I believe the rapture will happen before he will be revealed. And we've talked about that, praise the Lord, that we don't have to be there at that time. Uh, But we can certainly see a system of Antichrist developing in the world today. We can see uh, powers at work that that seem to be lining up, just as the Bible talks about them lining up uh, before the end times there. And so um, one of the things that we can look at, and, and 
in looking at who the Antichrist is, again, I don't think we know. We, there's no way we can know for sure. But what kind of patterns does he uh, show us in the Bible of who he is? Uh, we can get a picture of, of what kind of person he is, the lineage he comes from, and, and there's a lot of different clues that we can look at. And as time is wearing on here, there's a lot of Bible prophecy guys out there uh, that are really starting to look at the Islamic faith as, as fulfilling many of the, the types and shadows of the Antichrist. And uh, it, it's really... I've done a lot of reading on it just recently, and it's amazing how many people, guys that were, you know, clearly in the camp of uh, the Western Roman Empire being the Antichrist, who are now seeing and and saying, man, we were wrong. It's got to be, you know, more in this direction. And so we don't know for sure, but I just want to look at some very striking parallels that we see when, in, especially in these verses right here, these are some of the, the verses that guys are looking at and saying, man, this really seems to fit what's going on in the, uh, the Muslim faith and the Islamic um, terrorism and all that kind of stuff that's going on out there. And so one of the things that we're going to look at here, of course, uh, the main characteristic that you find about the Antichrist, no matter what passage you're looking at, uh, it really deals with him being just prideful and blasphemous against the one true God, against uh, against Jehovah God. And so there you see it. Uh, he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and speak blasphemies against the God of gods. And so um, that's a, a main characteristic of the Antichrist that we've looked at on numerous occasions. One thing that we haven't really taken a look at, and this is a very interesting verse here, uh, in verse 37, he says, He shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. And so what is being spoken about here? Well, the, the verse there, the word that, um, where you see, neither regard the God of his fathers, that can be God of his fathers or gods of his fathers. Uh, either one in in the uh, the Hebrew there, and so many people believe that it's actually the gods of his fathers. He won't acknowledge or regard any of the gods of his fathers, whatever gods his fathers worshipped before. Uh, of course, many of the um, the religions of the world are are not monotheistic. They don't believe in just one god. They believe in many gods, and so that's a definite possibility. But this verse right here is is kind of the key text for a lot of people who believe that the Antichrist is actually a Jew. And this is the verse that they will bring out to say that the Antichrist is really a, an apostate Jew um, and will be used by Satan in some way to you know, just be the Antichrist. Um, this is really the only verse that they use to do that. And, and I don't think the text really justifies it. It's kind of a strange interpretation um, and, and one of the reasons they think that he is a Jew is because he will make a covenant with the Jews and, and allow them to rebuild their temple and those kind of things that we've talked about. Um, but again, you know, the, the text doesn't really bring that out. It just says he won't regard uh, whatever God his fathers worshipped. And so I don't think that's a, a reason for us to automatically assume he's a Jew. Um, what is interesting about this, if it is the Islamic faith, um, remember that the text that's written here was written in the 6th century BC uh, and Islam didn't come about until the 6th or the 7th century AD. And so uh, whatever God is being talked about here, uh, Islam wasn't worshiping the gods of, of their fathers. They're, they've kind of made up, they've kind of taken all the gods that their fathers were worshiping and kind of condensed them into one, Allah. And uh, that is what has happened within the, the religion of Islam. They had many, many gods, the moon gods and all kinds of different gods that they worshiped in Arabia as the different tribal gods uh, were just kind of condensed into one god, the god Allah, the moon god. And so um, that's a possible reference to that. But um, either way... Muhammad was uh, at one time a believer in the God of the Bible, Jehovah. 
And he was a believer in Jesus Christ. But it seems like he was rejected for some of his views. And uh, when he was rejected, then he turned against uh, Israel and, and Christianity and, and kind of went out and made up his own religion. And so that's another possible interpretation there that people point to that he's just kind of making up his own religion. And that, it, that is kind of what happened with Islam is they just kind of came up with uh, a religion that they, they borrowed from Christianity. They borrowed a little bit from Judaism. They borrowed a little bit from their tribal gods back there in Arabia and came up with Islam. And so that's a, that's a possible interpretation there. Uh, the other part of this verse here, that's the Jewish Antichrist. We talked about that already. Uh, where it talks about he doesn't regard the rights of women or he doesn't regard the desire of women. And many people look at that portion of it and they see the word desire and then they see the word women there and automatically assume he's a homosexual uh, because he doesn't desire women. But that's really not what, what it's saying. It's saying uh, he, shall ne- he shall regard neither uh, the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. And so what it's saying there is he, won't, he doesn't regard the rights of women or the desire. Of, he doesn't care what women say, what women want. Uh, their desires or their wants. And so that's a a better interpretation. Of course, that lines up very closely with uh, the Islamic faith. I mean, they're the worst when it comes to the rights of women. And uh, they do um, have a very harsh record when it comes to that sort of thing, Uh, Sharia law being what it is. And I don't want to go too deep into that. I might be uh, decapitated for it, but... Let's just move on. Um, it does. Uh, it is another interesting point here. He, he won't regard any god, for he shall exalt himself above them all, but put in their place a god of fortresses. A god of war is basically what is being spoken about here. And many people have, have tried to say, well, the United States is worshiping a god of war because of all the money that we put into our uh, our our military and, and our technology as far as our military goes. And uh, I saw some websites that tried to say that we are the Antichrist because of all the money that we put into it. We're a god. We worship a god of fortresses. We worship a god of war. Uh, and, you know, to some degree, I guess that's fair that we do put a lot of money into our military for the protection of our nation. But, um, again, when you're, when you're trying to narrow it down of who the Antichrist is and where he's going to come from, you have, to, you have to use all of the, the puzzle pieces and fit them all together. And obviously the United States doesn't fit much of the, the rest of the, the puzzle pieces. Whereas Islam is, a God of, is worshiping a god of fortresses. Uh, and you can look at jihad and, and just the jihadist ideals is really the word Islam means submission, submission to Allah um, and you know, there's there's a lot of different ways that is worded within the media, and and they come out and say well, we're we're not a, a, a religion of violence, we're a religion of peace, and that sort of thing. But all you have to do is look at the history of Islam to understand that the meaning of submission to them is when they come to you and say, uh, do you acknowledge Islam or do you acknowledge Allah as the only God? This is their, their mantra. There is no God but Allah. And Muhammad is his messenger. And if you're willing to play along with that, if you're willing to confess that, then we have no problem with you. We have peace with you. If you're not willing to confess that, then we've got some problems. And so, uh, you know, all of our problems with Islamic terrorists could be over in a moment if we would just simply say these words. There is no God but Allah. And Muhammad is his messenger, and they wouldn't fight with us anymore. Anybody willing to do that? And so there you go. Uh, They are advancing that, and they have advanced that for the last 1,300 years with the tip of the sword. And there is absolutely no contradiction to that whatsoever. You cannot say that that hasn't happened for the last 1,300 years within the history books, it's full of it. Now, you know, obviously people point to Christianity doing that as well. The big difference there is the Christian uh, sects that have done that and have tried to 
convert people at the tip of the sword, obviously don't go along with the teachings of what Jesus said. Um, whereas the Quran is promoting that idea, that idea that all should be in submission to Allah. All right, well, so I, I think you can see there um, the God of fortresses and a God which his fathers did not know, uh, honoring with silver and gold. Let's see, in verse 39 there he says, uh, thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses. Again, um, the Islamic terrorists are acting against the, the, the strongest nations on the earth. They don't, they don't seem to care that they're a, a small group relatively, um, but they're going around kicking all of the, the, the big dogs on the, on the block in the shins and, and don't seem to mind. And so they are advancing their cause uh, and striking out against the strongest fortresses with this foreign god. And so that's a possible interpretation. What is another interesting aspect of this uh, verse 39 here? Uh, when it talks about at the end, it says, um, he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land. Uh, let's see. That's another thing I want to look at here. Advance its glory. He shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land. Some some people see this as kind of a, a redistribution of the wealth. If you look back over at verse 23, when it was talking about Antiochus Epiphanes there, uh, it talked about the fact that he was uh, making a league uh, with these folks. He shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. Uh, the word number is not in the original text. It's just to make the, the sentence flow but uh, some interpretations say that a small, uh, small people or the poor people or the lower class of people, uh, he shall enter peaceably even into the richest places of the province and he shall do what his fathers have not done nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, spoil and riches and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds but only for a time. And so... Uh, some believe that what is being spoken about here is kind of a, the way that the Antichrist comes on the scene and becomes so popular and becomes such a heralded world, world figure is because he's redistributing the wealth. He's going into those strong nations and he's you know, just kind of taken over and redistributing the wealth to the poor peoples of the world. And of course, that's going to make everybody pretty happy with him. And, um, except the rich people are losing all their money. But, uh, you know, that's a, that's a possible thing where it says there he divides the land for gain. And, um, and some people see that as, as a redistribution of the wealth. And, of course, you know, what do we see going on in the world right now? In our nation, we kind of see that happening as, as, the, as the, the very, very super rich. Um, it seems like our government is, is going after that and trying to do a, a bit of redistribution of the wealth uh, for the sake of boosting their popularity. And uh, it's kind of something that's been done throughout the ages. But anyway, um, closing verses there, we, we kind of get a picture of the Battle of Armageddon as uh, this Antichrist figure is now on the scene. He's in power, and now he's going to come against the nation of Israel with full force. At the, end, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall ex escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans, uh, the Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. And so 
Again, we see a big battle going on here. We see many nations involved in that battle. We see the nation of Israel being involved in that battle. Many countries are going to be overthrown. There will be a few that make it through in that region. Uh, but ultimately, we will see the Antichrist come to his end. And of course, those are very specific parameters. Uh, and, and really, only one battle fits the bill for that. Um, Many people kind of see the Battle of Gog and Magog being involved here, possibly, um, but it really doesn't uh, fit the, the parameters that have to be met. Obviously, the end of it comes with the end of the Antichrist, and we know that only happens when Jesus returns. And so it really has to be the Battle of Armageddon that is being discussed here. And I don't, I'm not going to go into depth on the Battle of Armageddon and, and the Battle of Gog and Magog. I want to kind of wrap that up next week as we just kind of look at a, a complete picture of, of the end of the tribulation period in, verse, in chapter 12 there. But uh, what is interesting when it talks about in verse 44, but news from the east and the north shall trouble him. A lot of people ask the question, who is this army coming from the east? Who are we talking about here? And China is thrown out there uh, and, and talked about because they have, they're the only country in the world that has enough people to muster a two million man army you know, in uniform, in the traditional sense of a warfare, uh, two million people actually in uniform. And so um, China has been pegged for that because they're in the east and because they have enough people. And it's possible that that's who we're talking about here. Uh, again, let's uh, flip on back to Revelation and take a look at that. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. We'll begin there. This is when the angel is pouring out, uh, the sixth angel pouring out its bowl. In verse 12, it says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and, keep it, and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And then the seventh angel poured out his bowl, and, and it goes on to talk more and more about what happens after that. But... Um, it's interesting, these false prophets, out of the mouth of the false prophets, there are spirits of demons coming out, performing signs, and they go out to all the kings of the earth and gather them together. They, they somehow coax them into coming into this region uh, to the battle of Armageddon. And of course, this is that epic battle where, where many, many people will die. Uh, and, the, and the blood will run up to the horse's bridle and all that stuff. And, and again, we'll look at that a little bit next week. But you see the kings of the east being mentioned there. Uh, the river Euphrates is going to be dried up, and the kings of the east will be brought in. Um, it could be China, obviously. It could be uh, a couple of different people. One of the ideas that's being floated out there now about this is that... Um, for the, the, the camp that believes that the European Union is still kind of the fulfillment of the Antichrist system and the, and the Antichrist government, again, we're trying to find out what system will be in charge when the Lord comes back, that, that fourth kingdom that ultimately will be there running the show, that worldwide kingdom that will have a religious, uh, commercial, and military um, aspect to it. At when the Lord returns. The camp that still agree that uh, Europe, Western Europe, uh, the European Union possibly, is a fulfillment of that, that system, uh, kind of agree with the idea that the Battle of Gog and Magog will have to take out all of the, the Islamic threats in the world. And uh, because 
even the even that camp agrees that the Islamic threat has to have something to do with end time prophecies. I mean, it's just very obvious that they have something to do with it, just based on the number of people there are involved and and their um, opposition to Christianity, their opposition to Israel. Um, and so what happens is the, the idea is that the battle of Gog and Magog will wipe out the Islamic threat completely. And then later on in the battle of Armageddon, it will be the other forces left over, possibly Russia, China coming in and, and, and being involved in the battle of Armageddon here. The problem with that view is that all of the nations that are seen as fighting against Christ when he returns are all Islamic nations. In, in every single instance, every nation that Jesus is fighting against, and I had a long list of references that you can look at, you can't find any reference in the Bible, I'm told, I haven't checked this myself, of a nation fighting against the Lord when he returns, and there are many that isn't currently an Islamic nation. And so you have to kind of get over that hurdle to, to think it's just the kings of the east that are coming. And, and so one of the things that's talked about is, well, how can you get a two million man army coming across that, that river, that dry riverbed? And if you look at Iraq, if you look at uh, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, all of the Islamic nations on, that, on the eastern side of that uh, Euphrates River, you can easily muster two, uh, 500 million man army. There, there are a lot of people over there that would love to just wash over there and, and try to wipe out Israel. And so it's easily done. Maybe it's not going to be a, a traditional army all in uniform and lined up in ranks with tanks and all the rest of that, but you, could, you definitely have the manpower, you have the motivation of those folks wanting to come over and take out Israel where you don't necessarily have that with China. Um, all right, well, uh, the two million man thing comes from Revelation 9 when it's talking about these bold judgments before they're actually released. Uh, in Revelation 9:14, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Uh, so the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now, the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And, and so that's where we get that number uh, of, of the kings of the east coming over. All right. Well, uh, we've kind of wrapped up there in the end of chapter 11. Um, one thing I wanted to close with, and, and again, you know, thinking about this willful king and, and just the, the evil uh, that it would appear is, is going to come upon this earth in, in our future, most likely. And uh, this willful king and, and just the willful disobedience to the Lord that we're seeing now within the world. What are we to be doing uh, from here on out? And, and I was just encouraged by what Paul told Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.1 You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What are we to be doing? We're to continue the work that the Lord has told us to do. We're continuing to teach the word of God. We're continuing to uh, disciple all nations. We're continuing to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're continuing to be obedient. We're continuing our loyalty to him, asking him to show himself strong on our behalf because we are loyal to him. Our hearts are loyal to him. And so that's what I'm going to close with. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You're all good soldiers of Jesus Christ, aren't you? Praise the Lord. Let's worship him tonight. Let's go ahead and stand. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the hope that you give us in in light of of the the pain and the suffering we see uh, that will happen in the end. Lord, we know that you are a gracious God. Lord, we know that you are righteous and we are on your side, Father. We are loyal to you. We love you. We honor you and we want to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we ask that you would fill us with your power. Lord, that you would fill us with your love and your grace for all mankind. Lord, that we may go out with your name upon our lips, Lord, and your love within our hearts, sharing with folks that 
Uh, They don't have to be there at this time when all of these things happen, Lord, when this willful king is released and uh, is, is allowed to cause the destruction, when he is allowed to desecrate your temple and your people, Lord, and, and cause so much pain and suffering on the earth. Lord, we, we just want to be able to share with folks that they don't have to be here at that time. And, and so, Lord, we ask that you would give us uh, the ability to go out and preach that message, Lord. Uh, Lord, that we would be bold about the faith that we have in you and we wouldn't hold back for any reason. We thank you for these things, Lord, and we just pray that uh, you just give us a, a time of great worship and fellowship as we leave here tonight.